Um, we're trying to get this thing to work so that um, I can hear the Zoom as well as connect, but it just looks a little bit. I'm just going to shove one. OK, great. Uh, I'm thankful for our team that is trying the, their very, very uh, best. Um, you know, we've got this Minecraft server now. It's curated, right? So, so it's kind of safe. Harold's watching over everything. He's watching the uh, kids' language. There's, there's different things that are, that are going around, you know. And um, we, we, our youth group, I know they're on Friday. They're connecting with people as well. Um, and so uh, have you ever, though, found, and so look, Let's begin today. I want to ask this question because if we can be very honest, like it is a frustrating time. I, I actually kind of appreciate the, um, the video that Harold showed because to me, uh, it probably looked very fun for everybody who is 12 and under. But to me, that just looked like a whole bunch of people running around um, with, with chaos, right? And then if we go to the, the video wall, you know, like, th that's all of us at home. Look how the excited face, look at everybody's excited face. Oh my goodness. You know, I think it is reasonable, it is reasonable to ask the question, do you ever just get frustrated? Um, if, if I could be honest, uh, this lockdown six, um, it's probably hit me the hardest. Uh, I mean, it hit everybody the hardest. Don't get me wrong. Like, I, I didn't mean it hits me the hardest, the most in the world. What I mean is that of all the different lockdowns, um, I think if I was to reflect on um, reflect on it, uh, mostly, I feel like I've been able to uh, make do. We've been kind of coming up with different things. I've been trying to, you know, I'm I'm rowing. I'm getting a morning routine up and running. We're doing, you know. Uh, a whole bunch of productive things. But lockdown number six, uh, especially since we, we didn't expect it to go so long, I think has gotten me, if I'm very honest, pretty, pretty frustrated. Um, and I, I don't want to get into sort of my, my woes. I, it's not a competition. There are a ton of people right now who are actually going through a frustrating period of uh, a frustrating time, but even more than that, some are going through distress, anxiety, um, hurt, depression, loneliness. There's a range of frustrating and and downer moods uh, around. Um, and I'm very grateful, actually, that the Bible speaks to all areas of our life. So today's sermon. If you, uh, if you want to study with us, we're going to go into Psalms 94. But I want to encourage you to uh, join us in Bible study just as we've got you know, everybody on uh, Zoom um, over there. We also want to have everybody on the Bible app with us. You can scan the QR code, but you can also type bible.com slash events and then 487-55462. For those who are listening on audio, um, and really, if it's too much for you to do um, during the service, part of why we have this and it's up on YouTube, it stays on later. Is during the week you can actually go to this link and then do your own reflection on the Bible verse for the week. You know, once we began this series, uh, probably at the beginning of August, this is the fifth Sunday that we're doing this. We said that it is important for us to read the Bible every day. Give us this day our daily bread is in the Lord's prayer. Jesus is not talking about your kaya toast. He's talking about your daily reading of God's word. I will go as far as to say you need to read the Bible daily. Uh, like we said when we started the series, one way to interpret the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is to view it as a portion. Give us this day, not the food that will last me for 10 decades so I don't have to read the Bible anymore. Give me this day the food that will last me for the whole year because I've got many other things to do. 
it is, give us this day the portion that I need for today. And so that tomorrow I will wake up and I will seek your face and seek your word again for my sustenance. God, every day I need food. Right? And so we are wired. Every day we eat. Every day we need spiritual food. And so that's why we're in this series. Um, and we're trying to deal uh, with, I think today, if we go into Psalms 94, we're trying to deal with a psalm that tackles frustration. Uh, you know, each of these Sunday services, they, we're doing the Bible in real life. It's kind of been crafted... So you're actually just hearing from my own personal devotion, to be honest. Like, this, I reason why I picked this passage is because this particular passage encouraged me when I was really frustrated. Uh, one of the things that, if I can give you a quick snapshot into my life, it's not that any particular thing is really bad. And FJ, you're a fantastic church, uh, you know. It's just, I think, if I were to, for me, it's a different issue for David, uh, King David. But for me, it is the scope it is the wide scope of things that go on in a pastor's uh, a week, you know, from genuinely being sad um, uh, uh, with, a, with a funeral of a beloved um, auntie in our church through to genuinely being happy and doing some weddings and new births around through to talking with people as they go through disappointments in life through to being the middle person when people are fighting over opinions and different views of life, through to just checking up on people who are stuck a little bit, through to having to change plans for, you know, we had the ACM denominational conference this week and we've had to change those plans. Uh, we've had to change a whole range of things. And so in any given day, I think for me, the real frustration is that I'm always changing hats and switching gears. And, and I know why I think the Bible can be so powerful is I know when I wake up in the morning and I open God's word, um, there is something that can ground and anchor me through whatever it is that I'm going through in my life. So on that happy note, let's read today's scripture. Uh, it goes like this. O oh Lord, God of vengeance, O oh God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O oh judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. O oh Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? You know, they pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. You know what? They crush your people, O oh Lord, and they inflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner, and they murder the fatherless. And you know what? They say the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. Oh, understand, oh, dullest of the people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does, God not, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, oh my goodness, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, to give him rest from days of trouble, until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, 
your consolations cheer my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied to you, those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and they condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. Yeah, the Lord, our God, will wipe them out. Oh, man. One of the things we're trying to do with this Bible in Real Life series is to not just pick Bible verses that are very easy to read and very easy to uh, understand. Yeah, because uh, if we're serious about reading the Bible, honestly, you're going to pick up some uh, not so politically correct Bible verses, and you're going to pick up some verses that you're like, oh my goodness, I don't even know what to do with this. And so we're going to go right into this passage. I, I love this passage. Um, because it covers a bunch of Christian cliches and it covers a bunch of emotions and realities in our, in our everyday human walk that maybe we don't talk about often. Uh, as usual, we're going to go through content, uh, sorry, context, content, and consider. So today I'm just going to lead this group that's here on the screen. Uh, so good to see everybody uh, there. And... Um, and all of you that are following on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, we're going to lead us in a little bit of a Bible study. So if you have Psalms 94 open, it would be very, very helpful. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we commit your word to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please enlighten us. Today as we open up for our daily bread, Feed us with your spiritual food. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. If there is a heading for today, it would be God, the rock of my refuge. All right? God, the rock of my refuge. And we are going to um, go right into the context. Because as with all things in Scripture you're about to discover that context, especially here, is very, very important. So, uh, And today, we're going to finish at 11.30. So this is going to be a quick Bible study because I want you to get ready for the prophetic ministry that we're going to have after. Because one of the ways that we can deal with our frustration, one of the ways that we can deal with the things that are going on in our world is not just to read Scripture, which we're going to be doing today, but we can also, you know, Jesus, when He left, He sent us the Holy Spirit. And God is active and moving through the Holy Spirit and alive and well in our world today. And we want to be able to do ministry even though we're all locked down. So uh, if you go to fjm.org.au slash Zoom, you can jump onto our Zoom wall. But you could also, um, at 11.30, jump in for our prophetic Zoom with Pastor Jeremiah. All right? Uh, so that's, that's pretty important. But let's do this Bible study 30 minutes. To, to me, it, 30 minutes is about the amount of time that I would spend uh, doing a devotional in the morning uh, as well. And so we're try I'm trying to give you a snapshot of what the Bible looks like in real life, hoping that you would every day read the Bible. Okay, so context, right? Context. Find out what's gotten us to this point. Look, what is, what's causing David to write this? Where are we in the Bible? And I thought that since this is a pretty complicated um, and controversial passage, um, let's keep it super, super simple. So I'm hopefully going to be talking about things today that everyone can either already know or that you can easily find out for yourself. So what do we know about this context? If I was doing this in a Bible study in my house, which we do um, on our family night over the dining table, these are the type of context answers I will get from our ki my kids. So I'll go like, what do you know about this context? And they'll be like, it's in the Old Testament. And we're like, okay, okay. 
That's great. It is. It is in the Old Testament. It's it's shared. <laughs> I mean, if that's all you can say about it, it is in the Old Testament. It is actually the Old Testament is shared with the Jews, right? Our Old Testament is the Jewish um, a Bible. One of the great things about it, you can understand in this context, is that it's remained relevant over time. You are reading something that is not like a tweet that disappears or a Facebook post that is just irrelevant after one year or whatever it is. You're reading something that has actually one of the oldest sections of our, of our, of our Bible. It teaches us um, a reality about humans. That's why it persists. Why do you think books, you know, like if you read some of the classics, why do you think books or movies um, remain famous over time. It's because they address a human condition and we still find it relevant. So one of the things you need to know about the context is it's in the Old Testament and you know what? The world is still reading it today. Whether you're Jewish or you're Christian, you're still reading it today. So at some level, there's things in here that could be relevant to us. Next, somebody in my family I'm sure would say, uh, Dad, I got the answer. The context is we're in the book of Psalms. <laughs> Yes, we are. We are. Psalms is poetry, right? It's not prose. Okay, so what you have to understand when you read this passage is we are not dealing with a letter of instruction. So David is not saying, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to say, uh, God, you are a God of vengeance. Yeah, and you're in it. You, it, this is not it. You are hearing David's heart cry. You're seeing the inside struggle of the author. You're getting a snapshot peek into a person's life and it's that person's life when you look into it is still relevant and going through same kind of things that we face today. It's not even like Roger uh, shared last week, it's not even an account of history. We're not we're not dealing with, you know, chronicles which is like historical this happened this happened. Nothing's happening here. The guy's like writing his journal and sharing his frustration, right? Next, what you need to know is, within the Psalms, this is a category of Psalms called lament. Uh, the, the technical word for lament is complaining. This is the, um, you know, if the Bible was able to help us relate through the highs and the lows of our life, laments help us to deal with, with the depths, the, the depths of our life. That's why there's so many books in the Bible. That's why I think it's healthy for a Christian to read the Bible daily so that your Christian diet is not just the sugar that is filled with just the, I don't know, the things that you put up on your wall or posters or, or favorite Bible verses everywhere, right? That the Bible, if you read it, addresses the height and the depth of our human life lives and the entire spectrum of how God relates with us. It's his words to us. In fact, let's go into a little bit more detail about the context. When is lament relevant? You know what? It's relevant when you are troubled by your own thoughts and actions. You look at the stuff that you're doing or you're concerned about the stuff that you're thinking, and oh my goodness, why am I thinking these things? It's also relevant when you complain about the actions of others. Oh, come on. Like, when you complain about the actions of others, turns out the Bible also addresses that. Laments are also very good when you are frustrated by God himself. Let me just say something about this category before we move on. Did you know that there, there are Christians, and I'll, I'll say there are Christians because I am kind of one of them. I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. In general, I'm not often, and maybe people, maybe I'm, my wife says I'm less sensitive than she is, right? So sometimes, uh, okay, often I'm not troubled by my own thoughts and actions, actually. I'm, I'm not in general, have a steady disposition. Then, in general, 
I don't complain about the actions of others. In fact, I see all kinds of crazy action going on all over the place, right? And I just go, ah, oh, again, you know, people just do whatever they do. And I, I try to, as a matter of Christian discipline, try not to complain about the actions of others. And in general, I like God. <laughs> in general, I'm not frustrated with God himself, just as, uh, you know. But even though that may be the case for me, let me tell you, this has occurred in my life. All three have occurred in my life in various seasons. It is not, and I think it is, part and parcel of the human condition. We cannot be Christians, and I, I chat with Christians all the time, they deny that anyone should be, that any mature Christian should be troubled with their own thoughts and actions. They deny that, they, that, that we should complain about the actions of others, and they deny the frustration by God. That's not even biblical. David himself is afflicted or dealing with all of these things, and the Bible has something for us when we go through these seasons. So let's not be Christians who can only, you know, like you, as parents, our kids only ever see the Sunday school version of our lives. That's not even biblical. That's why we're opening up Scripture today, all right? You have to understand that that is the context. Today, we're dealing with that context that touches a universal. And maybe if you've never experienced it, you just need to live a longer life. Or let's have a chat in lockdown number 10 or whatever it is, right? But there will come a time where you will not like your own thoughts and actions. You will complain about the actions of others. Uh, and you'll be frustrated sometimes with God himself. So let's get right into what does David say because he's experiencing all these things and he is he's writing this psalm almost as his internal journal. You're, you're looking into his life. That's the context, all right? So what does the text actually say? I think it's helpful to have a rough outline. Again, I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. A rough outline for this whole psalm and, you know, um, it's easy. I wanted to say... For some of you who think, oh, studying the Bible is really hard, like, it is easy to get an outline. One, you can just Google it. Two, if you get a study Bible, you'll get an outline with headings and things like that. Or three, you can message one of us and we'll happily send you an outline of any passage, okay? But here's a rough outline. Again, I'm, there's many you can choose from, but I'm going to keep it super simple for today's passage. The outline goes like this. From verse 1 to 11... We read the psalmist's concern, the thing that he is really frustrated about. It turns on verse 11. Something significant happens right at the peak, right at the center of this psalm. And then at the end, he places his confidence in God. Psalmist's concern, big main point, confidence in God. All right, I feel like that's a pretty simple so the psalm, and so I'm going to put like my own little headings as we go. These are the headings that I wrote as I was studying. through. But you can come up with your own headings. You can, you know, like work through the content yourself is what I would encourage you to do. But I would go, the psalm begins with, God, what are you doing? I know I like you. And I know you're like, good, whatever. But oh, my goodness. What are you doing? What are you doing? Let me tell you what you should be doing. All right. So it begins like this. And, and David, he is he's informing God. He is sharing his frustration because he's frustrated with what God is actually doing. He's, he's very frustrated about it. And here, here it is. Oh, God, God of vengeance. Okay, God, let me just tell you, all right? You are a God of vengeance. Oh, God of vengeance. I need you. Please shine forth. Can you rise up, O judge of the earth? Come on. Are you judge of the earth or are you not judge of the earth? All right? Because rise up and can you repay to the proud what they deserve? C God, how long shall the wicked, um, you know, how long should they exalt? How, how long should they celebrate? You know, they are pouring out the arrogant words. Or I'm not, like, and so he complaining, he's complaining to God, right? Um, he, he going, like foolish people are saying that God doesn't see. 
They crush your people, O oh God. And they afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and surgeon and murder the father. They're doing really terrible things. And they're saying, God does not see. The God of Jacob does not even perceive. He's like doing nothing. Uh, in verse 7. Which means we have to go to the next slide. Yes. The Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. I, I, I want to say, like, firstly, this is, this is David sharing his heart out. And sometimes we do think these types of things. Um, I like what Tremper Longman says in his um, How to Read the Psalms book. Um, he addresses this point because, you know, David doesn't mince his words when he's writing in his journal to God. As Christians, we resonate with the confession, but we find the psalmist's assertion of innocence almost presumptuous. Why? Why is it that the other people are all so wicked and God's like and 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 God of vengeance needs to judge them and discipline them? We're offended by the latter because we think of Paul's strong statements about the sinfulness of all of mankind, right? But we must remember that there are occasions when people are persecuted or harassed in situations and for reasons in which they are totally innocent. In fact, we're seeing this happen in our world today, right? Assertions of innocence, people who can come to God and say, God, I'm innocent, you got to help me, they do have a proper place in the context of prayer. We must remember this. And so then David goes on, he, sa he says, he, in verse 8, he addresses the evildoers and the fools. He goes, evildoers and fools. Oh, you know what? I've just finished my prayer to God now. I've told God what to do. In verse 8, he goes, evildoers and fools. You think that God is not paying attention? <laughs> verse 8, understand, O dullest of people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? Like, this is God. You know, God made your retina. You don't think he can see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge. And so in uh, verse 8 to 11, in this passage, he is addressing the fools. And he's like, oh man, you're going to be in trouble when my God of vengeance comes and deals with you. Because who do you think made you and who is going to discipline you? You are in trouble because the Lord knows the thoughts of man. They are but a breath. Meaning that you might think you're so smart, but it's going to disappear like your breath evaporates. You might be make, think you're making the right decision now, but pretty soon it'll be the wrong decision. I'll tell you now, it is a hard time to be human. Uh, I'll be very, very honest with you. I, I have great empathy for our leaders, our global leaders, our spiritual leaders, our political leaders, even the school headmasters and the company CEOs, I have a lot of compassion for them because it's a hard time to be a human, right? You could have your thoughts, you go, oh, this is exactly the right thing to do. This is exact. oh my goodness, this is what I'm thinking is the right thing to do. And then tomorrow, it's exactly the wrong thing to do. This is, this is our, our state because God knows the thoughts of man they're just a breath. However smart we are, like we have the smartest people in the world right now working on all kinds of things. But they're a breath. That's why the whole psalm turns on verse 11. The Lord knows the thoughts of man, they are but a breath. And here we see things turn in the content. And, and it's, it's so powerful. Like this blew me away when I was reading this. Because in verse 12, David says, blessed is the man whom you discipline. And in the first part, before verse 11, the person that he wants God to discipline, the one that he wants to exact vengeance on the, is the, the wicked, the other people. And then he, it's almost like you're, you're seeing David's brain, you know, go, go through. It's like, um, we don't need to go to the verse anymore. Um, uh, it's almost like you're seeing David's brain process. Oh, those people, they're so bad. Get them, God. Get them, God. You know why? Because the thoughts of men, they're all useless. Oh, they're terrible. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. I'm a man. I have thoughts. Oh, no. These are my thoughts. My thoughts are but a breath. Oh, my goodness. 
I need God's discipline. I'm, and you see the whole thing turn right here. Blessed is the man who knew discipline. Why do I say it turns? Right now, right now, he is not talking about the wicked or the people that he had in the beginning uh, verses. Right now, it is, he's talking about himself. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. That means it's not talking about the wicked. He's talking about this person whom God is teaching, who can, God can give rest in days of trouble. He's kind of talking about himself. It, 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 it leans itself to Proverbs 3, 11 to 12. Proverbs chapter 3, 11 to 12, which says that God corrects those whom he loves. God disciplines those he loves. So you, you, you see David, he begins with such a force. Oh man, you guys, you're all wicked. God is going to discipline you. It's gonna, and then he discovers, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Could I be doing something wrong right now in second-guessing God, in... In, in saying, God, you're not, you're not doing what I, I am, imagine. Like, if the thoughts of men are like a breath, maybe my own thoughts are like a breath. Oh, man, blessed is the man who you discipline, God. I've been asking you to discipline, and actually I need discipline. God, why don't you discipline me? Why don't you teach me out of the Lord, and you give me rest until whatever my issue is, is dealt with. That's why it's turning. He allows God, after this discovery, he allows God to take care of him and he allows God to take action. What you see in verse 14 onwards, is him saying, for the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous and all the upright heart will follow it. Um, you see in here that God has previously helped, because it says return, and he will help going forward. You see David start to now change his stance from beginning with complaining to God you see him change to placing his confidence in God. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against the evildoers? Well, if the Lord had not been my help, I wouldn't have got... So he's, he's, he's saying that God has previously helped him. In fact, he's gotten to where he is because God has been his help, so he can trust God. And then... You get right to the end. And I thought, oh man, this is so good. God, I'm writing stuff down in my journal. God, this is so good. You know, you're, you, I need to be convicted myself. I need to place more of my trust in you. And then David does the most confusing thing right at the very end. He, he ends the whole psalm in verse 23. He ends the whole psalm and he goes, and, and after all of those things, he ends it with, and God will bring back on them their iniquity. And after he's just turned the whole thing to himself and he's been convicted, all right, he again, he goes back to, and God will bring back on them their iniquity. And oh my goodness, I'm so upset with them. I'm so upset with them. And he will wipe them out for their wickedness. And then, and then he repeats again, the Lord, our God, will wipe them out. I, I, I sometimes wish that... Um, that he didn't say that because it kind of makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I, I'm not that style of person. But I think why that is there, because you are seeing David really share his heart, is that for David, for David, after going through that journey with God, the underlying internal issue for him is resolved. He can let it go because he now knows it's in God's hands. And that he has now established the kind of relationship with God where he can share even the darkest parts of his heart with God and trust God for justice. Trust God, not him. He's 
again, he's saying God will do this. God will do, right? Trust God for justice. So that leads us to, in the last six minutes, I want to think, um, just land us on some of the things that we can meditate on throughout the day. I've been meditating on this for a couple of weeks now, actually, um, just because I knew we were doing this. Um, can I ask you these questions? So this is what I wrote down for myself. Do I share my heart with God? Do I? Sh- That's something I struggle. You're an Asian guy. I, I-, I can be really honest with you. Um, I have to ask, I actually have to write down, do I share my heart with God, especially when I'm upset, when I'm frustrated, or when I'm down, do I share my heart with God, or do I ignore what's going on in my heart? Do I medicate by, I don't know, playing games, eating food, whatever? Do I take it out on others? But what's going on in my heart? I'm so frustrated with life and the world is not going the way I imagined it. Or whatever. Do I take it out on others? Like, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the term passive aggressive, right? It is when people don't even know what is wrong, but you're like really upset with them. And partly it's because instead of sharing the stuff with God and, and, and sorting it out, you are taking it out on others. So um, I had to ask myself, and, and, and reading the Psalms, it begs that question for you as well. And I hope that as you listen to this, that you would ask the question, do, do I really share my heart with God? And that actually means that you've got to take some time to do it. Not just, oh God, I imagine you know my heart, so I'm just going to just do all my normal things uh, and never talk to you. Right? David, he takes the time to not just journal down even his deepest, darkest thoughts. He takes the time to make it a poem. He, he takes the time. To, like, this is not just like, hey, God, I only have one minute. I'm done with the psalm. No way. This psalm is so beautifully written in Hebrew, it would have taken him ages. And he, he likely even put it to music. Right? So you're, when he shares his heart with God, you can tell it's coming out of a rich time with him. And I want to ask you the question, modern day Christian, do you have that rich time with God where you share your heart with God? Secondly, when I read this, I, I, yeah, as the kind of Asian guy that I am, I'm confronted with the fact that I have to ask, am I in touch with the true state of my heart? Or am I just always used to thinking, oh, God's good, and I I should never complain about others, and I never doubt my own actions or my own thoughts or whatever it is. Like, am I in touch with what's really going inside? Uh, It was pretty confronting for me, and I want to challenge you, like, uh, especially as we go through this season of life. Why don't you do some of these things? You can walk and talk with God. Just go, we're allowed to go for a walk. Why don't you just go out and get in touch with the state of your heart? That's what this psalm is about. It's not so much about instruction and theology and, you know, letter to the church or history. Or, it is about, are you sharing your heart with the person who loves you the most? The God who made you, who you can be completely open. The God who can be with you as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So, are you in touch with the true state of your heart? Well, you could walk and talk to God. You could journal. You could sit down like I journal. And some people, you know, they prefer walking and talking. Some people, they prefer writing or journal. You can even make a poem, right? You could speak in tongues. The Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit can utter for us in groans and, 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 and sounds that we can't even articulate. So if you are just praying in tongues, trust me, that is also you getting in touch with the true state of your heart because you are interceding in ways that you can't even, your brain can't even comprehend. You could read. You could read scripture because scripture actually reflects your heart. Did you know that? That the the Bible has been described as a mirror that can show the state of mankind. And then you can reflect and meditate. Uh, That's why Psalms 1 says that we are to meditate on the word of the Lord day and night. These are ways that you can be in touch with the true state of your heart. Don't be that guy or that woman who is not even aware of the dark state of their own heart and you're just stinking up everybody else. You're just like hurting everybody else. 
be in touch with the true state. Don't leave it there. God can address you right where, he, uh, where you are, but don't deny or ignore it because the Bible can speak into it. Lastly, I think you want to ask yourself a very honest question. Can I trust God? David begins the psalm by going, God, you know, I'm not even sure I can trust you because you, you, you need to really show up. And he ends with, yes, yes, God's got it. He will actually destroy my enemies. He will actually take care of it. So I don't need to, I can take my care and I can place it with God because God will judge. He will avenge. He will make right. And he may not do it in the way that I imagine because my thoughts are just like breath. But you know what? I know this about God. God will strengthen. He will console. He will love. He will hold me because God, you are my fortress. Wow, fortress, yes. God, you are the place where I can go and I can block out all of the things that are attacking my life, all of the things, even my own thoughts that are attacking my life, even whatever, my own concern, whatever. I can go to this fortress, fortress, this refuge, and I can share my heart. I can go through the depths of human life and you are there. You've been there in the past, which is what he says in the psalm, and you will be there in the future. And you know, for David, the next part right after that is Psalms 94. It's amazing when you go to God, how just getting a load off your chest, just placing it in God's head. Anyway, we're humans, right? How much can we change? We're not. I, 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 I wish, wish the whole world was different and I could, could fly on a plane and then go, like, what am I going to do? So much can happen when you place the things that God can handle into God's hands. And, and David does that. He does Psalms 95 after that. Oh, come. Hey. Yeah, hey. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to his presence with thanksgiving. David completely changes his mood. Um... We don't have to be stuck in lament. It is true, an actual part of our lives, and we need God can be there, but He can also take us out of it. And that's why today the title of this message is God, the rock of my refuge. Now, I know there's some of us right now, we're very frustrated, and we are doing, you know, probably one of the hardest lockdowns of, of my life anyway that I've ever seen, right? Uh, we want to take some time to minister to you. We want to allow God to speak into your life and into your world. Uh, and, and look, we are very restricted, right? So that's why we're doing this Zoom. We may not do it every Sunday. We're just going to take it Sunday by Sunday. But this Sunday, we've got a prophetic ministry with Pastor Jeremiah Yap that is going to start right now. That's how we're going to end our service. If you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube, what you want to do right now is... Um, you can close down YouTube. It's fine because you're going to see that feed on Zoom. And you want to go to fjm.org.au slash Zoom. Two things, though, I want to, um, as instruction, if you're jumping in, it's two things that need to happen when you're coming into the Zoom because we, we, will, we, we may or may not let you in. You need to have your camera on and you need to put your real name. So don't log in as Zoom user number 23. Turn your camera on. It's, a, it's our own Zoom anyway. We've got moderators around. Turn your camera on and put your real name. Because Pastor Jeremiah, we're going to be inviting Pastor Jeremiah uh, up soon. I don't know if he's actually here yet. He is? Brilliant. Uh, we're going to have Pastor Jeremiah. Oh, there he is. Oh, I see Pastor Jeremiah. So good to see you. Oh, I shouldn't wave backwards. I should like wave forwards. Uh, so good to see you, Pastor Jeremiah. It's such an honor to have you here. But Pastor Jeremiah is going to want to see your face when he's giving you prophetic words. In fact, he's going to be scanning through as well, everybody on that Zoom. Um, and he, and he um, is going to be prayerfully considering what God is speaking. So uh, you need to have your camera on for this. We are thankful for the many people who registered as well. Um, I'm going to pass this time now 
to Roger and Dan. They're going to lead us in a song of worship. And then after that, Uncle Roland is going to actually lead the session. So over to you, uh, Dan and Raj. Amen. I just continue to stay in this attitude of worship. Speak to us, Lord. We tune in. To- 